Uh, let's see, from uh, SpongeBob Imagination. My question would have to do with radiometric dating. As what, uh, sorry, as that is what's my, what's often thrown at us by evolutionists. Of course. Including old earth creationists. And again, I mentioned earlier in the program, and I realized the question probably came in before I addressed it, but earlier in the program, I did say that all radiometric dating processes, I don't care whether it's carbon-14, potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, uranium, lead, all radiometric dating processes. And for those who are not familiar with the term, I think we do deserve uh, for their benefit to define things, radiometric, a combination of two words, radio referring to the decay of radioactive materials to supposedly measure metric to supposedly measure the amount of time since a creature lived or or an event occurred. Uh, Carbon-14 is the most famous, uh, most easily heard of uh, in school, and therefore the one most people are familiar with. Uh, it's the idea that carbon-14 is generated in the upper atmosphere, breaks down over time, and we can somehow or another use it to determine how long it's been since a creature died. Uh, very basic, simple overall. Uh, but there are these other methods as well. But none of them. None of them work. All of them start with six fatal false assumptions, but carbon-14 has 20. Now, if you start with six fatal false assumptions or 20 fatal false assumptions, you cannot possibly come up with a reliable date. Is that correct? Now, the fact of the matter is, the only thing that carbon-14 is useful for is to prove that the Earth is young. Consider for a moment, uh, we have measured the decay rate of carbon-14. And it has a half-life of 5,730 years. Now, if anybody ever walks up to you and says, well, we have dated dinosaur bones as 68 million years old using carbon-14, the first thing to do is look them in the eye and laugh hysterically. Even if carbon-14 were valid, even if it worked, it cannot be used to date millions of years in the first place. Uh, it goes to zero somewhere in the areas of a theoretical 250, 350,000 years. The problem is there's not an instrument on Earth that can measure carbon-14 beyond 17 and a half half-lives, which for the audience is roughly 103,000 years. Here's the kicker. We cannot find any carbon deposit on Earth. We can't find any oil, natural gas, coal, or carbonaceous clays. We cannot find a carbon deposit on Earth that does not have significant amounts of carbon-14. That proves that all the coal, oil, natural gas, and carbonaceous clays on Earth must be less than 100,000 years old, indeed less than 50,000, but that would also make them consistent with 6,000. Therefore, carbon-14 proves the Earth is young. It cannot be used to date anything accurate except for the Earth, and it dates it as young. Now, it has 20 fatal false assumptions, but what about the six fatal false assumptions of all of them? Well, I don't want to get into too long a diatribe on this, but for instance, think with me for a moment about all of these radiometric dating processes. So the ability to measure radioactive materials in the present and then supposedly uh, use them to determine how old something is, uh, like a skeleton, or when an event occurred, uh, let us say, uh, the destruction of Troy. Well, first of all, we have instruments today that can measure the ratio of isotopes that exist in a sample today. We can measure the amounts of carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14 in a sample today but we don't know how much was there to begin with. You see, if you don't know the starting parameters, we only know the ending parameters, you cannot get a reliable date, period. Again, evolutionists uh, talk about the decay of uranium into lead. So we start with uranium and it decays into lead 206, which is stable and doesn't continue to decay. In the process, the decay chain has 13 intermediate steps from the original uranium to the lead 206. In that decay chain, every single element in the decay chain is itself radioactive and itself decays. Uh, three of the elements in the decay chain, uh, one is gone in less than a second. I don't care how much you've got of it, it's all gone in less than a second. Uh, another is gone in 3.05 minutes, and the other one is gone within roughly three and a half years. Therefore, if any of those materials were in a sample, 
when it came into origin, created or evolved, uh, whatever. But when it came into existence, um, we would never know they were there. All we can measure is the lead. So you have what's called the contamination problem. You don't know how much lead or any other radioactive elements were there. Uh, or, after all, the sample might have contained lead 206 to begin with. The evolutionary assumption is that all the lead came from uranium, and that's an invalid assumption. You don't know how much of some of these intermediates or if any of these intermediate elements were there to begin with. All you can measure is the amount of uranium that's there today and the amount of lead that's there today. So there's all kinds of invalid assumptions with these methods. Therefore, none of them work. Got it. Awesome. Well, um, uh, if you don't mind, some more questions. Sure. Uh, from that, okay. Um, are pseudogenes and junk DNA evidence for evolution? No. Because, first of all, pseudogenes have been found to have a purpose. You see, the concept uh, of uh, genetics uh, and uh, evolutionists like to talk about junk DNA. Uh, that term is so old, the evolutionists don't even use it anymore. So anybody who's still using that term simply isn't current with the literature. Uh, I'm not uh, being negative about that. I'm simply saying you, you haven't uh, stayed up with the literature, that's all. Uh, but the truth is that today we now know that basically all the genetic information is in fact useful. And it's the same thing with vestigial and retrogressive organs and structures. Today we now know there aren't any that they're all useful. Now, in the case of pseudogenes, we now know that they are, in fact, useful uh, and actually prevent genes from being destroyed, uh, also called retroviruses. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, everything in the DNA, with very small exception, has now been proved to be useful and functional. There is no such thing as junk DNA. Now, there is DNA that has been corrupted that it is not as good as it used to be. But the fact of the matter is there's no junk uh, 